Hey guys, this is Dawson Discussions, and my name is Nathan L. Dawson Jr. Today's date is April 19th, 2020. In this episode, I will be talking about the financial markets and how I think it can help build black wealth in the United States of America. As a disclaimer, I do fully support a black economic empowerment plan for the native black American uh, community because of the effects of slavery, Jim Crow, and the current black racial political policy of benign neglect. For example, um, well, in May 2019, President Trump signed Executive Order 13872, which is an executive order for the economic empowerment of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Now, because of the current political and social climate going on against the Native Black Americans, such as benign neglect, um, I do really do support a, um, a similar legislation on that executive order, similar to um, Executive Order 13872 for Native Black Americans. But at the same time, I don't think that's going to happen in the near future or the far future. So this video is actually self-help to build black wealth in the United States of America. And then hopefully we can actually lobby to get a bill passed for economic empowerment for the Native Black Americans, similar to um, that executive order, either through Congress or through the presidency. So stay tuned. So Aerial Investments Schwab Black Investors Survey finds out that there were 15% of new black investors in the year 2020 as compared to only 4% of new white investors. Uh, Carrie Schwab Pomerantz, who is uh, Charles Schwab's daughter and Charles Schwab owns Charles Schwab Corporation, that is one of the largest financial services company in America, told Yahoo Finance Live that the interest in the stock market is growing amongst younger blacks that may that may um, help close the racial wealth gap. Now, there's an almost equal number of younger black investors against their white counterparts under 40 years old, according to Schwab Pomerantz. Black Americans are, ta are talking more today about all aspects of money, debt, paying for college, and the stock market. And that's the beginning of financial security because it demystifies some of the language around money that she said. So while younger blacks have increased their engagement with the stock market, the survey finds overall blacks are still far behind their white counterparts when it comes to budding wealth. The survey finds only 55% of black Americans actually own stocks as compared to 71% of white Americans. She said that over time, the compounding effect of this investing gap could hurt blacks' retirement savings and their ability to pass on wealth to their next generation. When it comes to participating in a retirement plan, blacks and whites are fairly comparable, 53% to 55%, but the survey but the survey reveals white contribute more per month. Um, black Americans invest $231 on average as compared to $291 for their white counterparts, and more than twice as many black investors, 12% compared to 5% of white investors, said that COVID-19 pandemic led them to borrow against the retirement plan. And another discouraging sign, just 35% of black Americans feel that they are um, treated respect when dealing with a financial advisor. Schwab Pomerantz said that something the industry must address to ensure that all people have equal access to the resources in order to invest. Our study showed that black investors want to work with a firm that has some level of racial diversity, she said. We just want to make sure that everybody has the tools and the knowledge to be lifelong investors. The Ariel Schwab Black Investor Online Survey polled 2,104 participants with 1,007 identifying as black and 1,097 identifying as white. And all respondents were the age of 18 or older with 50,000 or, or more in household income in 2019. So a financial market is a market in which people trade financial securities and derivatives at low transaction costs. Some of the securities include stocks and bonds, raw materials and precious metals, which are known in the financial markets as commodities. The term market is sometimes used for what more strictly exchanges, um, organizations that facilitate the trade in securities, e.g. a stock exchange or a commodity exchange. This may be a physical location, such as the New York Stock Exchange or NYSE or an electronic system such as NASDAQ, um, acronym NASDAQ. Much trading of stocks take place on exchange. Still, corporate actions like mergers and spinoffs are outside of an exchange. While two companies or people, for whatever reason, may agree to sell a stock from one, from one to another without using an exchange. So within the financial sector, the term financial markets is often used to refer to the markets that are used to raise finance. For long-term finance, it's called the capital markets. But for short-term finance, it's called the money market. Another term used for, well, another common use of the term is the catch-up for all the markets in the financial sector. 
So um, you have the capital markets, which consists of the stock market, which of course draws the most eye, which could, which provides financing through the issuance of shares or common stock and en enable the subsequent trading thereof. You also have the bond market, which provides financing through the issuance of bonds and en enable the subs the subs the subsequent trading thereof. So essentially, the bond market is actually much larger than the stock market. You also have the commodity markets, which facilitate the trading of commodities. You have the money market, which provides short-term debt financing and investing. You have the derivative market, which provide instruments for the management of financial risk. You probably heard them as options, swaps, forwards, and futures. You also have the foreign exchange market or the forex market, which facilitates the trading of foreign exchange. And you also have the new kid on the block, cryptocurrency, which facilitate the trading of digital assets and financial technologies. So stocks, well, what is a stock? Essentially, a stock is a representation of fractional ownership of the publicly traded corporation in proportion to the total number of shares that the shareholder have. Stocks are actually securities that represent an ownership share in a company. So for companies, issuing stock is a way to raise the money to grow and invest in their business. Now for investors, stocks are a way to grow their money and outpace inflation over time. So when you own stock in a company, you're called a shareholder or stockholder because, well, you hold share in a, you actually have, claim on the uh, on the company's profits so stocks can be bought and sold or they can be bought and sold privately or on stock exchanges and such transactions are typically heavily regula regulated by governments to prevent fraud to protect investors and to benefit the larger economy stocks typically take form in shares of either a common stock or preferred stock as a unit of ownership, common stock typically carry voting rights that can be exercised in corporate decisions. But preferred stocks differ from common stocks in that it typically um, does not carry the voting rights, but is legally entitled to receive a certain level of dividend payments before any dividends can be issued to other shareholders. Stocks actually do carry risk than other investments, but they also have potential to reap much higher rewards. Stock investors can earn money in one of two ways, or in both ways simultaneously. Um, depending on the strategy you use. So one, if the price of a stock goes up during a time they own it, they can actually sell it for more than they paid for it, and this is called a capital gain. Another way for you to, to, for you to make money in the stock market is through dividends. Dividends are regular payments to shareholders. Not all stocks pay dividends, but those that do typically pay them on a quarterly basis, which is actually once for like once every um, every four months. Stock market sectors. You often see stocks broken down the type of business they're in. The basic categories most often include communication services, telephone, internet, media, and entertainment companies. Your consumer discretionary, retailers, automakers, and wholesale and restaurant companies. Consumer staples, food, beverage, tobacco, and household and personal product companies. Energy, oil, gas, um, exploration, and production companies. Pipeline providers and gas station operators. Financials, banks, mortgage specialists, mortgage finance specialists, and insurance and brokerage companies. Healthcare, health insurers, drug and biotech companies, and medical device makers. Um, industrial, airline, aerospace and defense construction, logistic machinery, and railroad companies. Materials, mining, forest production, construction materials, packaging, and chemical companies. Real estate, real estate investment trust, and real estate management and developing and real estate development companies technology or the tech sector, hardware, software, semiconductor, communication equipment, and IT services companies, and lastly, utilities, electric, gas, um, electric, natural gas, water, renewable energy, and multi-product multi um, utility companies. Stocks also get, uh, also get categorized by the total worth of all their shares, which is called market cap or, ma or the longer... Um, name market capitalization companies with the biggest market with the biggest market capitalization are called large cap stocks and then you also have your mid cap stocks and then you have the small cap stocks and those small cap stocks represent successfully smaller companies however there's no precise line that separate these categories from each other but one often used rule is that stocks with a market cap of 10 billion or more are large caps stocks having market caps between 2 billion and 10 billion are your mid caps and of course, um, stocks with market caps below two billion are treated as small caps. So large cap stocks are generally considered safer and more conservative 
as investments, at, well, at least for stock for um, stock investment goals. While mid caps and small caps have greater capacity for future growth, but they are riskier. And of course, small cap grow uh, small cap stocks are um, the most um, aggressive uh, in regards to the three um, market caps. However, just because two companies fall into the same category here doesn't mean they have anything else in common as investments or they'll perform in similar ways um, in the future. So examples of large cap stocks would be, think of Walt Disney, Coca-Cola, and General Motors. Long-term, well, long-established giants with the dominant positions in their industries over um, the past. Other large cap companies, even though they're still growth, would be Amazon, Google, and Apple. For your mid-cap stocks, think Papa John's, the pizza, Skechers USA, uh, the shoe company, Ally Financial uh, Bank, Delta Airlines, Airlines, and Dick's Sporting Goods Incorporated. And for small cap, think Abercrombie and Finch, Big Locks, and I think BlackRock Capital Investment Group. Another categorization method distinguishes between two popular investment methods are growth and value. So growth investors tend to look for companies that are seeing their sales and profits rise quickly. So the father of growth investing would be Thomas Rowe Price Jr. Um, he was known as the father of growth investing, and he founded a company called T. Rowe Price. And value investors look for companies whose shares are inexpensive, whether relative to their peers or to their own past stock price. So value, so the, I guess the father of value investing would be Benjamin Graham. Benjamin Graham, uh, you might know one of his protégés as Warren E. Buffett. Warren E. Buffett is a well-known value investor and he owns Berkshire Hathaway, which is a giant um, conglomerate that owns um, a lot of stake in Hellsberg Diamonds, I think um, Fruit and Loom, Duracell, Geico Insurance Company, and of course, all other um, subsidiaries. Well, growth stocks tend to have higher risk levels, but the potential returns can be extremely attractive. Successful growth stocks have a business that's having to strong and rising demand among customers, especially in connection with the longer term trends throughout society that support the use of these products. Competition can be very fierce though, and if rivals disrupt a growth stock's business, it can fall from favor quickly. Sometimes even just a growth slowdown is enough to send prices sharply lower, as investors feel that long-term growth potential is waning. Um, these companies would be um, Alphabet. Uh, Alphabet, they own Google. Um, you also have Facebook, Netflix, Amazon, Chipotle, Starbucks, Square, Twitter, and Roku. Of course, many of these growth stocks are usually expensive and they don't pay dividends because they actually pay the dividends into, well, they reinvest uh, what they can pay out as dividends, but they're actually going to um, reinvest it usually into, um, you know, expanding out the business and also um, invest into their own research and development. And also some growth stocks do pay very little dividends like uh, Microsoft. And also, I think Microsoft is still kind of growing and they also pay a very, very, very small dividend. Same thing with Starbucks, they also pay a very small dividend. But I think I would say that they are uh, characterized as a growth stock. But value stocks on the other hand are seen as being more conservative investments. They are often mature, well-known companies that have already grown into industry leaders and therefore don't have much room left to expand further. Yet with reliable business models that have stood a test of time, they can be good choices for those seeking more price stability while still getting some deposits of exposure to stocks. So again, uh, rewinding a little bit, um, back to dividends. Uh, many stocks make dividend payments to their shareholders on a regular basis. Dividends provide valuable income for investors and that makes dividend stocks highly sought after among certain investment circles. Technically, paying even uh, a penny per share qualifies a company as a dividend stock. However, stocks don't have to pay a dividend. Non-dividend stocks can be um, still strong investments if their prices rise over time. Some of the biggest companies in the world still don't pay dividends. Like for example, Berkshire Hathaway, they don't pay dividends. And it's a conglomerate, which is a really, really, really big um, business. Also, um, another term for dividend stocks is also um, income stocks. As the income from most stocks that pay out comes in the form of the dividend. However, income stocks 
also refer to shares to companies that have more mature business models and have relatively fair long-term um, opportunities for growth. Ideal for conservative investors who just need to draw cash from their investment for portfolios as soon as possible or in the near um, future. Income stocks are a favorite among those in or near retirement. So you have your dividend achievers. They raise their um, dividends uh, 10 years straight. You have your dividend aristocrats, 25 years straight, that they raise your dividends. And lastly, you have your dividend kings, 50 years of rising their dividends. Okay, silico stocks. Um, national economies tend to follow cycles of expansion and contraction with periods of prosperity and recession. Certain businesses have greater exposure to broad business cycles, and investors therefore refer to them as silico stocks. Silico stocks in, um, include shares of companies in industries like manufacturing, travel, and luxury goods because an economic downturn can take away customers' ability to make major purchases quickly. When economies are strong, however, a rush of demand can make these companies rebound sharply. Um, airline companies like Delta is an example of a silico stock, GM Motors, Automotive, and I think um, the Carnival Cruise Lines. And by contrast, defensive stocks, not to be confused for defense arm stocks like um, like weaponry, but defensive stocks, uh, they don't have those big swings in demand. An example would be a grocery store chain because no matter how good or bad the economy is, people still have to eat. So these stocks tend to perform better during uh, market downturns, while silico stocks often outperform during strong bull markets. So your silico stocks would be waste management, utility companies, and Dollar General. Blue chip stocks tend to be the cream of the crop in the business world, featuring companies that lead their respective industries and have gained strong, repu uh, strong reputations. Uh, they typically don't provide the absolute highest returns, but their stability makes them more f uh, favorable among investors with lower tolerance for risk. So your Coca-Colas, um, Costco, Walt Disney, uh, Microsoft can be um, described as a blue chip stock, Walmart, and Home Depot. And by contrast, penny stocks are low-quality companies whose stock prices are extremely inexpensive, typically less than a dollar per share. With dangerously speculative business models, penny stocks are prone to schemes that can drain your entire investment. And it's also for you to, and also um, important for you to know the dangers of investing in penny stocks. And here are seven things to look for when, when trying to invest in an individual stock. So one, a sound business model. A company with a clear focus has a better chance of reaching its goal. When the business is run simply, there is not much to draw the eye. However, it also means that the business is more likely to be stable and have a good growth curve behind it. There, um, this, is, this is because a simple business model does not require a lot of learning in order for it to implement it. Number two, superior management. An effective management team is crucial to the success of the success of a business. The decisions that a company are made by a management team, so any misuse of funds will affect their um, investors. An experienced management team has the best chance to lead a company into a prosperous future. How a person runs a business tells you how the business is. If someone can't run the business, then investors just can't make money. And especially because growth companies are so focused on increasing the profits and sales of their, of their organization, that management team is going to uh, matter a whole lot. But growing a company requires an innovative leadership team. Without it, growth cannot happen. Oftentimes, the investment thesis of a company is built around the quality of its management team. As an investor, you are entrusting your capital to the care of that management team. Their decisions on strategy, capital allocation, pricing, cost structure, and etc. affects the amount of free cash flow the company will earn. Also, another thing is um, a CEO should own at least 30% of the shares because it shows commitment to that company. And from a 2017 Berkshire, uh, Berkshire Hathaway letter, um, it says, betting on people can sometimes be more certain than betting on physical assets. Number three, significant market share. When a majority of individuals rely upon the products of a company, chances are the company has good insight into consumer preferences. So look into the product or service. What does the company do and what is the quality of the product or service? If the company produces a consumer product, investors can read all our reviews of the product to judge how consumers view the company's product or service. If you're researching a brick and mortar retailer, you should walk, um, walk their stores. If you're researching a restaurant chain, you should eat at the restaurant. If you're researching a software company, you should try to use the software. And investors should research how the company's product or, or service 
um, compares to the competition and how is it viewed by its customers. And also you want to look at the brand loyalty. How do consumers perceive the brand? Companies with a valuable brand don't need to fight as hard to attract customers back to their business for repeat purchases. And repeat purchases create a steady stream of recurring revenue for that company. Number four, competitive advantages. A company that is ahead of the pack will often be on a top of cutting edge trends and industry changes in areas like marketing and technology. You want to single out those companies that are likely to stay one step ahead of, ahead of their competition. This is called in competitive mode, coined by Warren E. Buffett. The unique sustainable advantage that keeps competitors away and allows the company to generate higher than average profits. The wider the moat, the longer a company financial success should last. Should last. The wider the moat, the longer a company's financial success should last. Within any given industries, companies are constantly trying to take market share from each other. For a company to avoid ceding market share to its competitors, the company needs to have a very strong competitive advantage. Competitive advantage can come in the form of a product or service that is very difficult to replicate, a cost structure that is superior to, to their peers, and a brand image that is superior to, to their peers, and etc. New developments. The quality of the human talent at a company is just as important as the quality of the management team. Not every company will be the next Apple or the next Google or the next Facebook or the next Twitter or the next next or the next Netflix. But it's important for management teams to foster a culture of challenging the status quo and trying new ideas. If a company places a high priority on research and development or R and D, it is likely that they will roll out its successful introductions. If their products take off, then so will the price of the stock. Number six, financial performance. A profitable company makes more money than it spends. Sure, we can't expect businesses to be profitable simply because they are a for-profit organization, but many survive for years by securing outside financing or using excess cash. So it's worth checking financial statements to look at profit margins. A great company generates a profit by charging more than enough to cover its costs. Very often, a wide economic moat allows the business to, one, charge a premium for its product or services, two, sell, at the, sell a higher volume to its customers, three, control costs and operate efficiently, or four, do a combination of the last three things. Profit margins vary by industry. Some industries have higher margins than others, so compare profitability among competitors to identify the best companies in each category. In each category. So you want to look at earnings. Represent the for a profit a company has earned is calculated by subtracting the, um, the expenses, interest, and taxes from revenue. For example, have the company be earnings during the last eight quarters or two years. You also want to look at free cash flow. Free cash flow or FCF, FCF represents the cash a company generates after accounting for cash outflows to support um, current operations and maintain its capital assets. Unlike earnings or net income, free cash flow is a measure of profitability that excludes the non-cash expenses of the income statement and includes spending on equipment and assets as well as changing in working capital from the balance sheet. Money a business has is used like a savings account. So the current assets subtracted from current liabilities in the next 12 calendar months. Now if anything happens, is that figure that you calculated positive? In case of an economic downturn, the business still has money to keep the business running. If you are a profiting business, and you have free cash flow, you can still sustain for however long the amount the business has. And lastly, dividends. Of course, dividends would be non-applicable for um, certain companies, but if you're looking for a dividend stock, uh, consider the last six um, key points and also dividends. So long-term profitability is a key consideration. Although any company can occasionally experience a profitable quarter, only those that have demonstrated consistent growth on an annual basis should be seriously considered. Earning growth between 5% and 15%, strong cash flows, low debt to equity ratios, and industrial strength. Now, uh, the question that you have to ask is, if the company is paying a dividend, is it increasing its dividend over a yearly basis? Because that will let you that will let you know of two things. One, it's uh, profitability because no business can consistently pay you that dividend um, if they aren't profiting from it. And two, more importantly for the investor, to protect yourself from purchasing power from inflation. Okay, what are the pros of owning stock? Well, from one, stocks annually return average around 10%. Uh, inflation on average is about 3.22%. This means that if you're getting that 10% return and 
there's 3.22% inflation, you're probably still earning a 6.78% or round up 7% on your money. That's actually a really great return as compared to um, keeping your money in cash or in a certificate deposit or in a savings account. Um, if you were to start off with $1,400 and you put away $10 a day or $310 a month for 50 years, assuming a 7% interest rate, I think you would probably have $1.5 million. If you instead um, have your contribution set at 620, which is double your monthly contribution with the same with the same factor of investing, then you will probably have 3.1 million dollars, as in 1,400, uh, 620 dollars monthly, 7 um, percent interest rate, 50 years. If I calculate correctly, should have about 3.1 million dollars. And of course, if you set your contribution to one thousand dollars a month, then you should probably have five million dollars, assuming the seven percent interest rate, and you start off with fourteen hundred dollars. And this is called the power of compound interest. Albert Einstein supposedly said that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who knows it um, earns it, and who and he who doesn't um, know about it pays it. I probably botched a I probably botched a quote, but. Um, uh, Albert Einstein said, you know, um, he probably said something about that. Now, of course, whether he said it or not, or if it's just um, a legend, because, you know, I'm trying to find like the um, uh, a quote on it. Well, never mind. Anyway, uh, compound interest is interest earned on and added to your original investment principle and thereafter also earns interest. So it in other words, it's um, compound interest is essentially where your money makes money. Keep in mind that contra in compound interest works both in your favor and against you. Uh, when you borrow money, you must pay compound interest to the organization that loans it to you. The compound interest grows your debt and thus works against you. So when you put, so when the investor puts your money into savings, the compound interest grows your wealth and thus works for you. The key to build the key to building wealth and achieve your uh, financial goals is to manage this direction of interest. The way you do that is to know your financial responsibilities, manage your money, and to protect your wealth. Uh, second, uh, another good thing about owning stock is you can actually get income from dividends. Many companies do distribute a portion of its earnings to um, its shareholders. Now, if you're an investor looking for um, a passive way in order to uh, obtain income, a dividend growth strategy can actually pay off very handsomely. Number three, it's a relatively liquid investment. Comparing stocks to other investments like real estate or gold and silver bullions, stocks are quite liquid, which means that you can easily sell your stocks to access the underlying dollar of value if you need to. While many other investments could have you wait for days, weeks, months, and years, stocks can actually be bought and sold in a matter of seconds. Number four, flexible investments. Stocks come in many forms. There are stocks that pay dividends, stocks that help save the environment, stocks that help support the fight against the uh, um, global pandemic going on right this very second. There's literally so many different flavors of stocks. There is bound, uh, there is something bound to actually uh, suit your fancy. Whether you're just trying to make most of your money you can, or just put your money towards a good cause, these investments can um, offer you a wide array of options. And it's very easy to invest in a stock. Um, there are so many online brokerages that allow you to buy and sell stocks, especially with these days, they're actually um, zero commissions, which costs you nothing to actually buy into the stock and then to sell the stock. So thus, investing has never been easier. Of course, there's you know YouTube videos that actually walk you through the step-by-step -step on how to invest and using what account, and there are even videos out there, again, with YouTube, walking you um, through like what stocks to buy based on your preference. And also, you have fractional shares. So if the stock that you want is, say, $3,000, and you don't have $3,000, you can actually invest probably $10, $15 to actually have a fraction of share of that company. And it's also a low barrier to entry. So um, when I actually started investing myself, um, they didn't run my credit score or anything that I know of to actually that say like, okay, your credit score is too low. You can't invest or, um, or uh, you know, as compared to other, um, um, to other um, high barrier to entry um, uh, investments. Okay, what are the cons of owning stock? 
Well, there's market volatility, especially in today's market environment. We are seeing incredible swings every day. Stocks are hitting all-time highs and hitting all-time lows. This is something that you have to be be prepared for as an investor. If you're investing in the short term, then these fluctuations, these fluctuations can be quite unnerving. However, if you're in it for the long haul, then you should know that um, your investments will increase in value in no time. Plus, you're not in really in a big rush to sell. Speaking of that market volatility, market crashes often happen, but don't panic. Crashes are, inev are inevitable, especially if you're investing in for the long term. Previous crashes have shown that you will earn your investment back in just a couple of years if you weather out that storm. Uh, with that being said, um, that means no selling your investments, especially when they're less than what you bought them for. That's actually a really good, actually, you actually as a, Actually, as an investor, you actually should want to um, look forward to market crashes because if you actually value the stock and then you actually know the intrinsic value behind it and then if you actually want to get beyond that stock, it should be a little bit more cheaper for you to actually buy that stock, which is actually one of the faucets of value investing. Capital gains taxes can be quite high. Um, so if you bought a stock worth $1,000 and then you sold it, say, eight months later for... Um, I don't know, um, $3,000 from $1,000 to $3,000 that you um, sold it, you probably made a $2,000 profit. If you're in that 24% tax bracket, you will probably pay $480 for a total net gain of 1520 So what if you decided to wait just a bit longer? You sell a few months later to claim a long-term profit rather than a short-term profit. Now the stock you're worth is 3500 leaving you with a gain of 2500 And your tax bill at the long-term rate of 15% is $375. Yes, you significantly made um, a more higher profit when you kept it for a little bit higher, uh, well, a little bit longer. But you're paying less tax because you're in that favorable rate. And now your total profit is $21.25. Number four. Uh, there's there's no guarantee return. Although historically the markets provide a 10% return, there's no guarantee, especially for short-term investors. The best way to ensure that you actually get um, that 10% return or after inflation about 7 to 8% is to keep your money invested for as long as you can. And lastly, it takes knowledge and time to analyze a stock. Not to say that having to analyze a stock is a bad thing. Um, that's actually what separates the successful investors from the rest anyways. But it simply requires more time and effort to pick the right stock as compared to picking the right savings plan, uh, the right savings plan for your money. Okay, moving on to bonds. Fixed income investments such as bonds pay a fixed interest rate over a given time period and then return investors money. Well, and then, yeah, return investors money or the principal. So bonds are used by companies and governments to raise money for borrowing from investors. The basic features of the bonds are principal, the face value of the bond. The bondholders repay this amount in full when the bond matures. Maturity, bond maturities can range anywhere between one day to up to 30 years. Bonds with maturities of less than a year are generally known as money market instruments. And the coupon. The coupon is the interest rate that is paid to the bondholder or the investor. Uh, the interest is usually fixed and paid semi-annually or annually. Bonds are also rated from AAA, which is the highest grade, to C based on the credit worthiness, which is C, which is the credit worthiness is not that great. AAA bonds are perceived to have little risk of the default and its um, issuers have a very strong capacity to meet its financial obligations. But junk bonds like the double Bs and lower, on the other hand, have higher default risk, and but at the same time, they also offer much higher yields. So low risk, low loss of money, but if you don't lose the money, you're only gonna get a little bit of money. Higher yield, yield higher returns, and with those higher returns, there's a chance that you probably lose a whole lot of money generally a, a rule of thumb between um, risk of low risk and high risk. A bond market price, which is different from its face value, is also affected by uh, prevailing interest rates. Bond prices have an inverse relationship with money with interest rates. As, the, as, um, as prices fall, as interest rates increase, as investors have more opportunities to generate higher yields elsewhere. Similarly, bond prices increase as interest rates fall, as the bond's coupon rate becomes more attractive compared to interest rates elsewhere. So the type of bonds. So one type of bond is a corporate bond. A corporate bond is a debt security that is issued by a firm and sold to investors. The company gets the capital it needs and in return the investor is 
paid a pre-established number of interest payments at either a fixed or a variable interest rate. When the bond expires or, again, uh, reach maturity, the payment sees an original investment is returned. In general, corporate bonds are considered to be to have a higher risk than governmental bonds. So as a result, interest rates are almost higher on corporate bonds, even for companies with top flight credit quality. So um, corporate bonds issued in uh, blocks of 1,000 and face or par value uh, almost all have a standard coupon payment structure. So typically a, a corporate issuer will um, enlist the help of an investment bank to underwrite and market the bond offering to um, investors. So the investor receives regular interest payments from the issuer until the bond matures. At that point, the investor reclaims the face value of the bond. So the bond may have a fixed interest rate or a rate that floats according to the movements of a particular economic indicator. Another type of bond are the, the United States Treasury Securities. Uh, these are U.S. government debt instruments issued by the United States Department of Treasury in order to finance government spending as an alternative to taxation. Treasury Securities are often referred to as treasuries. <laughs> um, there are four types of marketable treasury securities. You have your treasury T-bills, your, your treasury T-notes, your treasury T-bonds, and your treasury inflation protected securities, the TIPS. The government sold these securities in auctions conducted by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, after which they are traded in the secondary markets. Treasury securities are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States, meaning that the government promises to raise money by any legally available means to repay them. Although the United States is a sovereign power and may default without recourse, a strong record of repayment is, has, um, has given. Now, Treasury securities have a, represent, uh, have a reputation as one of the world's lowest, world's lowest risk investments. So regular weekly T-bills are commonly issued with a maturity date of 4 weeks, 8 weeks, 13 weeks, 26 weeks, and 52 weeks. The Treasury T-notes have maturities of 2, 3, 5, 7, and up to 10 years, have a coupon payment of every 6 months, and are sold at increments of $100. The Treasury T-bonds, or the Treasury long bond, have, a, have the longest maturity at up to 30 years. Um, they have a coupon repayment every 6 months like the Treasury T-notes. And the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, uh, TIPS, or you can pronounce it as TIPS, inflation index bonds issued by the U.S. Treasury. The principle is adjusted with respect to the Consumer Price Index, or the CPI, the most commonly used measure of inflation. When the CPI rises, the principle is adjusted upwards, and if the index falls, then the principle is adjusted downwards. So T-bills, um, four weeks, eight 13, 26, and 52 weeks. Treasury notes, 2, 3, 5, or 7, or 10 years. And treasury bonds, um, 30 years. And you also have your U.S. savings bonds. So these are debt securities issued by the U.S. Department of Treasury alongside the, um, well, treasuries, to help pay for U.S. government borrowing needs. U.S. savings bonds are considered one of the safest investments because they are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. So the Series WE bonds, Series EE bonds, are guaranteed to double in value over the purchase price when they mature 20 years from the issuance. Though they continue to earn interest for a total of 30 years. Interest accrues monthly and is compounded semi-annually. That um, is, becomes part of your principal for future interest earning calculations. If a bond compounded interest does not meet the guaranteed doubling of the purchase price, the treasury will make a one-time adjustment to the maturity value at 20 years, giving an effective rate of 3.5%. The bond will continue to earn the fixed interest rate for 10 more years, and all interest is paid when the holder cashes the bond. Series I bonds have a variable yield based on, on um, inflation. The interest rate consists of two components. The first is a fixed rate, which will remain constant over the life of the bond. The second component is a variable rate adjusted every six months from the time of the, the time the bond is purchased based on current inflation rate. The fixed rate is determined by the Treasury Department. The variable component is based on the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, for urban areas, CPIU, for a six-month period ending on ending one month prior to the rate adjustment. New rates are published on May 1st and November 1st of every year. Now, another type of bond is the municipal bond. A municipal bond is a debt security issued by state, municipality, city, or county to finance its capital um, 
expenses, including the construction of highways, bridges, or schools. They can be thought of as loans that um, investors make to local governments. Um, cool thing about these are municipal bonds are exempt from federal taxes and most state and local taxes, making them especially attractive to people in high income tax brackets. So municipal bonds are exempt from federal taxes and most state and local taxes, making them especially attractive to people in high income tax brackets. So municipal bonds also be known as muni bonds or just munis, um, spell it M-U-N-I. Uh, these can be, again, you know, thought as loans that um, investors make to the local government so they can actually support um, the local government and the state uh, infrastructure. So interest paid in municipal bonds is often tax-free, making them an attractive investment option for individuals in high tax brackets. So although the tax benefits are attractive, they're not always um, 100% risk-free because, you know, some cities and states, they can also declare bankruptcy. And then when that happens, well, you know, your bond, it's... Um, wiped out because they can't pay for the interest anymore. And high yield bonds. High yield bonds, or well, formerly called junk bonds, um, are bonds that pay higher interest rates because they have lower credit ratings than investment grade bonds. High yield bonds are more likely to default, so they must pay a higher yield than investment grade bonds to compensate um, investors. Issuers of high yield debt tend to be startup companies or capital intensive firms with high debt ratios. However, some high yield bonds are fallen angels that have lost their good credit ratings. From a technical standpoint, or from a technical viewpoint, a high yield or junk bond is pretty much the same as regular corporate bonds since they both represent debt issued by a firm with the promise to pay interest and results uh, the principal at maturity. Junk bonds differ because of their issuers' poor credit quality. Okay, so what are the pros of owning bonds in general? Well, the investment returns are fixed. You receive a fixed rate of interest and your principal return when the bond matures. You know exactly how much your returns will be. Also, they're less, compared, they're less risky compared to stocks. Besides receiving a specified investment return, the bondholders are often paid first over shareholders in the event of liquidation. They're also less volatile. I mean, um, a bond's value can fluctuate according to current interest and inflation rates, but are generally more stable compared to stocks. And lastly, bonds have clear ratings. Unlike stocks, bonds, well, unlike stocks, bonds are universally rated by um, by um, credit rating agencies like Standard & Poor's and Moody's. This gives investors more assurance when picking up bond, but you can probably still want to conduct your own research and do the, and due diligence before investing. And of course, municipal bonds, they have that, uh, that tax-free, um, feature which is very attractive for those in high um, income tax um, and a high income tax bracket okay what are the cons of owning bonds in general uh, I didn't mention earlier that the investment returns are fixed well while this well while this offers higher safety for investors it, it's also a disadvantage because you actually forego the higher uh, potential gains if you invest in equity or stocks um, the largest sum of investment is needed. While some bonds can be purchased for relatively low sums, at least $1,000, some bonds may require larger amounts, which may put them out of reach for some investors. They're also less liquid as compared to stocks. Some bonds may be highly liquid, those issued by the treasuries and major corporations, but bonds issued by a smaller, less financially stable company like a startup may be less liquid as there are few people willing to buy them. Bonds with a very high face value will also be less liquid as the pool of potential buyers is smaller and the direct exposure to um, interest rate risk. Interest rates affect the value of bonds more directly as compared to stocks. If you plan on just receiving interest payments and holding a bond to maturity, this might not be a concern for you. But otherwise, bondholders are more exposed to interest rate risk um, than the long-term bondholders are. Okay, this is uh, part one of my financial, man my financial market um, video. Uh, part two will be uh, dropping in soon, so stay tuned for that.